chapter 15, The Bright Side of Camelot. Thou art the midwife of my woe. Shakespeare, King Richard II, 2.2, 63. The idea of a modernizing monarch is almost an oxymoron. Monarchy, one of the oldest forms of governance, and often seen as ancient Persia's contribution to the political legacy of humanity, is by definition a traditional form of rule. Its legitimizing narrative is invariably based on the traditional idea of divine right. Whether it was the ancient Persian and Zoroastrian notion of Farah, Izadi, divine aura, or the Islamic concept of Zelawa, shadow of Allah. Modernity, on the other hand, is founded on the idea of popular sovereignty and natural rights. People of the modern polity are citizens instead of subjects. They have inalienable natural rights in a traditional feudal society. The rights of the subjects are only those the king deigns to give them. The Constitution of 1905, in an effort to make Iran into a democratic polity, combined these two incongruent concepts by making monarchy both a divine gift and an institution predicating, predicated on the support of the people. Machiavelli is regarded as the first political theorist of the modern age. He was the first philosopher to understand that the age of inherited legitimacy had ended. A modern prince, Machiavelli, said, must develop his own language of legitimacy, wherein the rights of self-assertive citizens are recognized and respected. The Shah, in this sense, was a historical anomaly, if not an anachronism, a man of contradictory affinities, a prince who had inherited his power but did little to develop a theory to legitimize it, a ruler who promoted social and economic policies that hurled Iran into the modern age, yet was insistent on ruling the country like a 19th century oriental despot. Events in the life of the Shah during the first years of the 1960s captured the contra this contradiction. The Shah's rule so coincided with what scholars call the third wave of democratization, when in less than 50 years, more than 50 countries chose the path of democracy, maintaining and consolidating an author authoritarian regime in the age of democracy was doubly, was doubly difficult, and the Shah's response to a student demonstration in January 1962, a few months before he left Iran for his visit to the United States, captures his many ironic inconsistencies. On the afternoon of a day when student demonstrations at Tehran University were brutally suppressed, when one student was killed and an estimated 200 injured and arrested, the Shah was chairing, as was his wont, a meeting of the Supreme Economic Council. Before the meeting began, the Shah paced the large room with his hands clasped behind his back, a sure sign of anguish to those who knew him. Then he angrily said, What do these students want? After a brief pause, invoking the royal we, he continued, We have given them everything. What else do they want? His was a rhetorical question intended only to register dismay. One man in the room took the road less traveled, and instead of safe silence of acquiescence, he chose to talk, even dared to disagree. His name was Mehdi Samai. By then, he had established an impeccable reputation as an honest banker, a diligent maker, manager of men and policies. A close 
confidant of the Shah, a man always willing to speak the truth. That day, Samai was already anxious because he intended to raise with the Shah the case of Feridun Madavi, a distant relative and a young leader from the ranks of the National Front, who had been arrested along with other student demonstrators. Semai asked for permission to speak and then said, Your Majesty, the problem is that the things you say you have given them they simply consider parts of their inalienable rights. What they object to is being told they are given these rights and being deprived of their other rights they also think they have. When the Shah was still the crown prince and just returned to Iran from his years in Switzerland, he tried to surround himself with men of intelligence and erudition. When, for example, he heard from Dr. Ghassam Ghani, himself a physician, scholar, and diplomat, of a weekly meeting of some of the country's leading literary lions, people like Mohammed Ghazini, Ghazvini, and Zoka uh, Mulk Faruhai, he asked them to hold their meetings in his presence at the court. Anxious to learn, he quietly listened to their erudite discussions. Even as king, many of his early advisers and courtiers were seasoned, thoughtful men of politics. But by the time he was on his way to America in 1962, the Shah had less and less interest in the company of the types of men who attended those literary gatherings. The preparations for the trip to the Kennedy White House were, in a sense, the harbinger of a crucial change in the quality of the men the Shah picked as aides and as office holders. He was beginning to lose patience with men of Amini's generation, men who had seen him in his dark and defeated hours, men like court minister Hussein Allah, who had a paternal sort of regard for him. Not long after his American journey, the Shah began the process of changing not just the fabric of Iranian society, but the quality of the people who surrounded him. He called it a house cleaning. Gradually and inexorably, he brought to the center of power a new class of technocrats. Before long, even the advice of men like Samai would no longer be welcomed by the Shah. He never shunned Semai, and though he eventually stripped him of political post, he made sure he did not suffer economically. Moreover, the ascendance of technocrats had for the Shah the added advantage of matching at least one element of the new U.S. strategy in Iran on Iran. At the same time, the men who surrounded the Shah in his private life were a combination of his childhood friends and a coterie of unsavory characters who used their proximity to the king to illicitly enrich themselves. With a few exceptions, when picking friends, the Shah was a poor judge of character. In fact, even before going to the April 1962 meeting with Kennedy, the Shah had made a m major move in expediating the rise of an aggressively ambitious young man who took pride in his plans to arrive at the pinnacle of power with the help of his American friends. His name was Hassan Ali Mansour, and he came from a family with a long, controversial political pedigree. Mansur's father, Ali Mansur, had been a prime minister with a badly tarnished reputation as an Anglophile and a crook. Now his son took pride in having Gracian Yatsevik, the CIA station chief in Tehran, as a tenant and as an enthusiastic ally and supporter. 
Mansour had worked with Iran's foreign ministry since graduating from Tehran University's Faculty of Law and Political Science. In his first assignment in Europe, in the months after the end of the World War II, he met a colleague named Amir Abbas Hovvedia, and the two became lifelong friends. By 1957, Hodveda had left the foreign ministry and accepted a job with the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees, and Mansour had decided that the slow pace of rise in the stullified hierarchy of the foreign ministry was ill-suited to his ambitions. He returned to Iran and also convinced Hoveda to come back telling him of the promise of his American friends to help him become Prime Minister. Together, Mansur and Havedia worked to create what they called the Progressive Circle with the Shah's support. Mansur soon had membership in the High Economic Council and a ministerial portfolio. The late 1950s had been called the era of dowries in Iran, informal but regular gatherings of like-minded men and a few women who met to talk about the political situation in the country and plan for the future. The dowries would have been de facto embryos of political parties had they ever been allowed to simply follow the natural progression of their ambitions. The progressive circle was just such a dowry, and with the Shah's blessing, it did eventually grow into the Iran Novan New Iran Party that was to dominate Iranian party politics for much of the 1960s and the first half of the 1970s. Mansur's meteoric rise to power in Iran no doubt spurred on by the Shah's public support was nothing if not a subtle nod to the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations about the Shah's own intent to bring about reforms in Iran. As dispatches from the American embassy in Tehran show diplomats stationed there clearly understood the meaning of the Shah's gestures. There was one last detail the White House wanted to take care of before the Shah left Iran for his visit to the United States. Aware of the problem of the Iranian students and the Shah's intense sensitivity to critical comments in the American press, the White House took a preemptive step to lessen the a likelihood of bad press for the Shah. The American embassy in Tehran was instructed to convey to the Shah the following list of things which should be avoided in order to maximize a favorable public impression of visit. 1. Wearing of uniforms by the Shah except at Washington arrival, departure and wreath laying ceremonies. 2. Purchasing or ordering of expensive clothing, jewels, or automobiles. 3. Lavish distribution of gifts. On Tuesday, April 10th, the Shah, accompanied by the Queen and an entourage of ten, arrived at New York's Idlewild Airport aboard Pan Am Flight 115. On some occasions, even before he had his own jet, if the Shah flew on the Iranian airline Homa, he would go to the cockpit and pilot the plane part of the way, particularly during takeoff and landing. But this time, the Shah was not at the controls. The royal couple arrived in New York at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon and was taken directly to the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where the presidential suite, the famous suite 35A, was set aside for him. The presidential suite 
at the Waldorf is a three-bedroom apartment with a big living room and a dining room that can seat more than 40 guests. In one corner is the desk used by General McIntyre, MacArthur. Kennedy's rocking chair is in another. A beautiful Cartier clock adorns one of the walls. The East River and the Hudson, as well as the UN buildings, are all visible from the windows of the suite. Outside the entrance, today there hangs a silver plaque with elegantly engraved names of the heads of state who have stayed in the apartment. Since 1931, every U.S. president has stayed there at least once. Other heads of state mentioned as past residents include Queen Elizabeth, King Hassan, Emperor Hirohito, Nikita Khrushchev, and even Nikolai Kosasu. Kosexu, the Roman despot. In 1962, and every other time the Shah stayed at the hotel, particularly after Iran's oil revenues suddenly jumped and the Shah's entourage grew bigger and more extravagant, he was afforded an even more ostentatious royal treatment. But today, for reasons that are not clear, the name of the Shah is missing from the Silver Royal Register. At 10 o'clock on the morning of April 11th, the Royal Entourage left New York for National Airport in Washington, where they were met by President Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline. The Shah dressed in a dark suit and recently had a haircut and looked more like a military cadet than a head of state. Kennedy stood behind the podium with the Shah, the Queen, and Mrs. Kennedy standing behind him, and looking into the cameras, he welcomed the Shah and the Queen to the United States, suggesting that the two leaders shared much as they were. They both wanted freedom, peace, and a better life for their people. When it was the Shah's turn to speak, he read from a prepared text and seemed nervous. His English was correct, but had something of a novice in it, its locution. Instead of looking at the cameras and the microphones, he stood at an angle and had his eyes fixed on President Kennedy and his wife. He talked of the magic meaning that the word America had come to have around the world. After the brief welcoming comments, the Shah and the President rode in the presidential limousine while Mrs. Kennedy and Queen Farah followed in the next car. They drove to Blair House, the official state quest guest house used by foreign dignitaries. The Shah gave the president the gift he had brought him, a 10th century ceramic bowl, eight and a half inch in diameter, in off-white glaze decorated with bird and scroll designs, after a private lunch and a visit to an Islamic center, and after placing a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington National Cemetery at 8 o'clock that night, the king and queen of Iran, both dressed in formal attire, attended the state dinner given in their honor by President and Mrs. Kennedy. The Shah wore a blue royal sash, across a white shirt and a tuxedo jacket. The queen wore a long yellow gown, a white fur cape, and a matching bejeweled tiara and necklace. Mrs. Kennedy was dressed in a long pink and white gown with long white gloves that extended well above her elbows. Aside from the meetings with President Kennedy and others in his administration, the Shah it had three big speeches to give on that trip. The first was the night of the state dinner. 
the second was his talk before a joint session of congress and the third was his appearance before the national press club he seemed to have followed a common strategy in all three he wanted to point to iran's rich history and its shared values with the west he wanted to argue for a more military assistance and a bigger iranian army most important of all the Shah wanted to highlight his own legitimacy as a reformer. It was a measure of the value he placed on his trip that before leaving for America, he had hired a tutor to improve his English. His impeccable command of French had always been a great asset, and from then on, his ease with English would also become part of his international identity and a subject of repeated praise by the western media by then shojadeen shafa had been the shah's speechwriter for about four years and two of the shah's american speeches with their repeated references to iran's past poets and thinkers and their influence on the west were evidence of his influence during the White House state dinner, Kennedy began his brief welcoming remarks by observing, It has never been easy to be a Persian from the oldest times in history till today. Were the words meant to conjure echoes of Montesquieu and his treatise on the difficulties of being a Persian in the modern age? Kennedy then talked about how the Shah had carried the burden of ruling his country for 20 years already, and might carry it for another 20 years. As it happened, he was wrong by only three years. In an effort to show his support for Amini, Kennedy praised the Shah for surrounding himself with able and dedicated ministers. Yet the president avoided as much as possible mentioning Amini's name, finally reflecting the many references in his briefing papers to the Soviet threat. Kennedy ended his talk by referring to the fact that Iran lived in the belly of the bear, and then commended the Shah for keeping his country safe from the Soviet threat. When it was the Shah's turn to speak, he began by referring to the history of the strong and amicable relationship between Iran and the United States. He talked of the first American missionaries who came to Iran, and he praised the work of men like Dr. Samuel Jordan, who gave his life and youth to promoting culture and education in Iran. He conjured the memory of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the quintessential American intellectual and poet, citing his lyrical eulogy of the Persian poet Sadi and his virtues of honesty. The Shah then quoted Kennedy's own profiles in Courage, concluding from it, that he had hitherto been able to stand up to the malicious attacks on him only because justice was on his side. The pomp and ceremony of the state dinner and the Shah's attempt to underscore his pedigree as a genuine reformer were all a prelude to his much-anticipated discussions with Kennedy scheduled to begin the next day. At 9.30 in the next morning, the Shah walked into the cabinet room of the White House for the first round of his meeting with Kennedy. The American and Iranian delegations were already seated around the Oval Table. They had been informally discussing Soviet machinations in the Middle East, an issue on which both sides were in complete agreement. On each side of the table, the center seats were left empty, designated for the Shah and the President. But before being seated, Kennedy led the Shah into a small private room 
off the Oval Office, where the two talked alone for 15 minutes. No notes of this meeting were taken. Once the Shah and Kennedy emerged from their private meeting, the President began by offering a brief account of their private discussion. Even the short summary he provided makes it amply clear that theirs had been a heated and contentious meeting, what diplomats call a frank and serious discussion. According to Kennedy, the Shah had discussed Iran's requirement for greater military assistance, and the President had said that no buildup of an Iranian armed forces would enable it to withstand the Soviet attack along alone, and that the greatest present danger to Iran was internal, and that the current government program in Iran, namely Amini, appeared to be aimed at reducing this danger. There was the crux of the problem. The Shah was worried about the Soviet and Iraqi threat and wanted a bigger army and more military expenditure. While Kennedy believed the biggest threat faced the Shah was the domestic situation and wanted to push for more reforms and bigger slice of the budget for social expenditures. Since it was the U.S. government that had to pay for much of any expansion of the Iranian military, Kennedy's views carried particular weight. He wanted to convince the Shah that the Iranian army was essentially for maintenance of internal security. And for, the pur and for that purpose, Iran needed a modern, albeit significantly smaller force. To sweeten the deal, the United States proposed a new program that provided the Iranian army with sophisticated equipment. Moreover, Kennedy had ordered his staff to prepare a list of all commitments and semi-commitments of any importance made by the United States for defense of Iran. In other words, Kennedy wanted to reassure the Shah that in the event of a Soviet attack, the United States would be there to help. The list of such commitments included 12 items from the Tripartite Declaration of Tehran, assuring the Shah that Iran does not stand alone in the face of these Soviet pressures. The Shah was not convinced. I can tell my military, he said, that they shoulder no responsibility in the defense of their country against the Soviet aggression. Before his next meeting with Kennedy, the Shah was to appear before a joint session of Congress, an hour bestowed only on important visiting dignitaries. Though the Shah had already appeared twice before such a joint session, the third appearance was controversial and nearly cancelled. A few members of Congress had objected to the invitation and threatened to walk out when the Shah was introduced. It was a sign of the Shah's precarious position in the new era of American politics, and only after considerable cajoling by the American embassy in Iran were congressional leaders persuaded not to cancel the invitation. Julius Holmes, the American ambassador to Iran at the time, was an unabashed supporter of the Shah, and in Washington was sometimes jokingly called the Shah's envoy. The Shah's speech to Congress, delivered on Thursday, April 12th, around one o'clock in the afternoon, was the longest of his trip. It expanded some of the ideas he had first articulated during his remarks at the White House dinner. The big difference was that in the congressional speech, he put more emphasis on the reforms that had begun in Iran. He made sure the Congress knew that it was he who had given the government of Amini some authority to carry out these changes. Like Kennedy, 
the Shah had no desire to use the dread Amini name. The Shah's last major speech was to the National Press Club. He was more at ease on this occasion and even engaged in some light banter with the journalist. He offered an optimistic image of Iran's future, but also tried to convey a sense of nonchalance about power. Let me tell you bluntly, he told the journalist gathered there, that this king business has given me nothing but headaches. Over the last twenty years since the beginning of my rule, I have not had even one day of peace and comfort, something every human being is entitled to. The intended audience for his blunt message was not so much the journalists gathered there, but officials of the Kennedy administration. One of the ironic paradoxes of the Shah's character was that while he certainly clung to power tenaciously and fought vigorously to increase his personal hold on levers of authority, he was also from the beginning a reluctant monarch, ready to give up the throne whenever a serious threat appeared on the horizon. The Shah also tried to reassert his dedication to reforms and underscored the fact that, long before the Kennedy administration came to power, he was a reformer. He talked of the days when the world and Iran were both caught in the throes of the Second World War, and how even then, he had advocated social justice and demanded that every Iranian must have a guaranteed minimum of free education, free health care, decent housing, adequate clothing, and adequate food. The Shah went on to add, with clear hints of pride in his choice of words, that the next day some of the people present in that meeting began to say to the Shah, to say the Shah of Iran has become a communist. The Shah bedazzled the journalist with what the British ambassador to the United States called his diplomatic adroitness, when in response to a question about whether Iran was still selling oil to Israel, he said with a smile, We know nothing about that. In July 1962, about three months after he returned home from America, the Shah accepted Amini's resignation. Many in Iran, as the Shah himself knew, believed that the sole purpose of his American trip had been to convince Kennedy that Amini was expendable. If there is any evidence for such an alleged agreement between the Shah and Kennedy, it must be the aid memoir covering the Shah's second discussion with Kennedy on April 13th. The president said that it was true that there were special situations in different countries which required special solutions. The Shah, however, is the keystone of Iranian security and progress, and the president continued, must keep pushing toward further development. Beneath the thin veneer of diplomatic formalities, the message seems clear. The United States wanted reforms and thought Amini was fit for the job. But if the Shah could undertake the same reforms, the United States would be just as happy. This clearly seemed to be the Shah's interpretation. The lead editorial of Etiliat, the Tehran Daily, that reliably reflected the Shah's views on pending issues, offered the same interpretation. As diplomats who met the Shah after his return noticed, he depressed, even despondent, his depressed, even despondent mood had turned to a jovial, self-assured confidence. Pleasant as many aspects of his American trip were, the Shah also had to face the embarrassing fact that Iranian students in the United States had organized angry demonstrations against him. The Shah, according to the CIA report, was particularly bitter about the demonstrations. This was the beginning of the Confederation of Iranian Students, relentless activities against the Shah. For the rest of his tenure, he would never again travel 
to a Western European or American city without the specter of student demonstrations haunting him. Ironically, by the late 1960s, communist countries were the only places the Shah felt safe from the harassment of demonstrations by leftist Iranian students. After the official trip, the royal couple stayed on for a few more days in the United States. The Queen had never been to America before, and this, the Shah told the American ambassador, would be a good chance for her to see some of the continent. He also wanted to spend one night in London. The London trip was declared by the Shah to be private, in spite of the fact that because of other visiting dignitaries, it was a particularly inconvenient time for the British government to host the Shah. They went on. They went out of their way to roll out the royal red carpet for him and his entourage, including a meeting with Queen Elizabeth. The issues of this meeting almost created something of a diplomatic rift between the Shah and his British host. The Shah was initially asked to join dinner, join a dinner, and the Queen had already planned to give in someone else's honor, but he took umbrage at the idea. He felt that his position demands that he should be invited in his own right and not as a guest at a dinner given on another occasion. The British government changed plans to fit the Shah's wishes. Their efforts were a revealing sign of the incipient competition between Britain and the United States over influence in Iran and amity with the Shah. The Shah's private London visit, in fact, had a purpose other than a mere stopover for rest or the catching a performance of My Fair Lady. The sole purpose, as a foreign office soon learned, was to collect his personal aircraft, a small private jet he had bought. Moreover, he did not want the British government to make this part of his trip known to the press. Maybe he and the American warning against expensive purchases in mind Sorry, maybe he had the American warning against expensive purchases in mind when he made the request to keep his purchase of the same of the plane quiet. The Shah and his wife made one more stop before returning home, going to Montreux to visit the Shah's daughter, Shanaz. Her husband Ardashir and his father, General Zahidi. The general was by then in frail health, and the Shah was keen on trying to reconcile with the man who had saved his throne in 1953, but had lived in virtual forced exile since 1955, and bore some resentment against him, whether the general ever forgave the Shah for what he considered was his royal ingratitude is not clear. Back in Iran, the Shah received help from two sources in his attempt to get rid of Amini. On the one hand, dissension within the Amini cabinet had all but paralyzed it. Amini's relationship with his ambitious minister of agriculture, Arsenjani, was at a breaking point. Arsenjani had begun avoiding not just cabinet meetings, but other important committees and functions. He had become openly contemptuous of Amini, and had said more than once that he will brook no interference from him or anyone else in the land reform or agricultural affairs. Arsenjani was not the only minister in defiant revolt. Safi, Asfia, and Kodadad, Farman, for Mayan, two of the cabinet's key economic technocrats, were also resigning, each for different reasons. Many of the younger technocrats were turned off by the fact that in the midst of a serious national crisis, Amini had taken time off to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca, a two-week ordeal, at the end of which 
the pious sojourner returns carrying the coveted title of Hajji, one who has gone on a pilgrimage to Mecca. Amini's picture in the traditional garb of a pilgrim, a long piece of white cloth with no stitches made on it anywhere, as required by Islamic law, wrapped around the pilgrim's body like a shroud, appeared on the front page of some newspapers and became for weeks the subject of satirical comments. Adding to Amini's problems was the ballooning budget shortfall, estimated to reach more than $200 million for the next fiscal year. The Shah also received unexpected help from Edward Mason, who was sent by the White House to get a first-hand look at the situation in Iran. He arrived in Tehran on a fact-finding mission in June 1962 and found the Iranian situation most discouraging, with the operational budget swollen and the deficit increasing, the relentless demands for increased pay for teachers by the cantankerous Minister of Education, Mohammad Derek Shesh, the leader of the striking teachers who had been given a ministerial portfolio to appease the strikers, and the Shah's unwillingness to accept a decrease in the military budget combined to make a balanced budget a pipe dream. Moreover, Mason found that Amini was ill-exhausted, unable or unwilling to assert his will and restore fiscal order. All of these facts convinced Mason that the Shah alone possesses sufficient power and authority to take necessary action. Mason further concluded that under prevailing circumstances, U.S. should not attempt a bailout operational budget by any kind of support. Mason must have learned what everybody else seemed to have known for some time, without America's support and the constant infusion of U.S. aid for the operational budget. Amini could not survive. A few days after Mason delivered his assessment to the White House, Kennedy sent a personal message to the Shah conveying his personal concern over the apparent serious deterioration in the economic situation, reminding the Shah that when they had our most cordial talks here in Washington, we agreed that accelerated economic development was the best road towards the bright future for Iran. What Mason had found out in a few days the Shah had known for a few months. The Shah knew that his Amini problem would be resolved only if he kept the military budget at least constant. Kennedy's letter was a subtle, albeit not forceful, request for a reduced military budget, but the Shah simply chose to ignore the request. He must have sensed that the new U.S. policy was to live with the Shah and attempt to mold him, i.e. support the Shah reform program and work through him rather than attempting to circumscribe his role. On the afternoon of July 17th, Ali Amini and his Minister of Finance, Jahaguar Amuzagar, met to discuss the new budget. After going over the numbers a few times, they realized they had a substantial shortfall of at least $35 million, even after a 10% across-the-board reduction of expenditures. They decided that, unless they could balance the budget, the cabinet should resign. Before informing the Shah of their decision, they decided to meet with the American ambassador and ask for an emergency loan. Around 11 o'clock in the evening on the same day, Amu Zegar arrived at the U.S. Embassy and asked for an emergency meeting with a very surprised ambassador, Julius Holmes. Unless the United States was willing to give the government an emergency $35 million loan, Holmes was told, the Amini cabinet would resign. Holmes believed that Amini was simply bluffing, and he therefore unceremoniously said no to the loan request. The next morning, Amini convened an emergency meeting of his cabinet and informed them 
of his decision to resign. I mean, he had assumed that the United States would somehow find a way to solve his budgetary crisis, but after Mason's report, the Kennedy administration was no longer willing to bankroll the Amini experiment. According to the British Embassy, the Shah accepted the Amini resignation with a marked degree of personal satisfaction. He then appointed Asadullah Alam as Prime Minister. By then, Alam had be Come at once the Shah's master of mirth, and the enforcer his reliable aid. In the most sensational political and even family issues, Alam's mandate was clear. He was to continue the reforms started by Amini, but accept the fact that they would henceforth all be under the direct aegis of the Shah. Even the name used to describe these reforms was to change. On the day of Amini's appointment, Etel Ayat, Tehran's conservative daily considered a mouthpiece of the court, wrote an editorial called White Coup or Red Revolution. Change in Iran was inevitable, the paper opined, and there were two paradigms for this change. One was promoted by the Soviet Union and was a Red Revolution. The other was supported by Kennedy and was a white coup. The Shah, the paper said, had wisely chosen the white coup. A few months later, Amini, in the course of answering a journalist's question, said, There is nothing unusual going on in Iran. This government has simply decided to pursue a white revolution that it deems necessary and in the nation's best interest. It has been the consensus of historians that this was how the term white revolution was coined. Some of the Shah's critics, hoping to underscore their calm, their claim that the entire project of reforms was masterminded by the United States, claim that even the term white revolution was coined by Chester Bowles, the American official sent to Tehran by Kennedy in 1962. But in a fascinating report, the British Embassy in Tehran claims that in 1958, Alam went to the embassy and offered a program of reform which said he wanted the Shah to adopt. He used the now much quoted phrase, white revolution. It is possible that in voicing these views, Mr. Alam was acting as a sounding board for some of the Shah's own ideas. However, before long, not only did the White Revolution itself metamorphose into the Shah and People Revolution, but in the Shah's narrative of this revolution, there was no place for Amini. There was something surprising about the Alam tenure. When the appointment was first announced, foreign diplomats in Tehran observed that Alam would be nothing but an instrument and a mouthpiece for the Shah. In the view of the American embassy, the Alam appointment was the closest thing to direct rule of Shah. Alam completely devoted servant from outset. There will not be a question in anyone's mind of independence on part of PM. The embassy made another revealing observation about Alam. They had come to believe that many members of the new cabinet, including Alam, have or have had British connections and may have been under British influence. Was the Shah trying to assure Britain of its continued relevance in Iran by the appointment of an Anglophile prime minister to carry out a program supported by the United States? Whatever the Shah's intentions, and whatever the embassy's estimation in reality, Alam went on to play a crucial role in July 1963, saving the monarchy in its first major confrontation with the clergy. The Shah's clash with the clergy was the culmination of a few years of planning on both sides. In 19. 55, when under pressure from the clergy, the Shah had approved the attacks on members of the Baha'i faith. 
the British ambassador went to talk with the Shah about the bed influence of reactionary, reactionary mullahs. The Shah, in response, said he agreed that the mullahs must be kept in their place and out of politics, but he thought it would be about two years before he could take them on and avoid any serious problem. The Shah missed it by a few years, and the confrontation took place not in two but in eight years. Even then, trouble was not altogether avoided. The first stage of the big confrontation was with radical clerics, took place over an apparently insignificant proposed change in the election bylaws for local councils. Until then, the law had called for everyone to take the oath of office using the Quran, in recognition of the fact that there were large numbers of religious minorities in Iran, Zoroastrians, Jews, Christians, and Baha'i. The new language simply suggested that the oath must be taken with a book. Mullahs began a concentrated campaign using their elaborate networks to agitate against the new law. Their main line of attack was that the law was part of an assault on Islam and paved the way for Jews and Baha'i to use their own holy books to take their oaths. The mullahs opposed the new proposed law from a reactionary perspective. Nevertheless, nobody in the opposition came to support came to the support of the new proposed legislature. Ayatollah Khomeini took the uh, unusual step of writing a letter to the Shah. The letters exchanged were notable both for their decorous language and their firm, unbending positions. Ayatollah Khomeini had heard reports that in the new election law, Islam is not indicated as a precondition for standing for office, and women are being granted the right to vote. As you know, national interest and spiritual comfort are both predicated on following Islamic laws. Please order all laws inimical to the sacred and official faith of the country to be eliminated from government policies. A couple of days later, the Shah responded. The first noticeable part of the retort is the way he chose to address Khomeini. In an obvious dig, the Shah did not use the title of Ayatollah, but instead called him Hojat al-Islam, a much lower rank. The Shah said that the new laws proposed by the government contain nothing new, and I went to remind you that I am more than anyone keen on respecting our religious rules. At the same time, I want to remind you of the conditions of the time and the situation in other countries of the world. The Shah ended his note by telling the cleric that he would forward his letter to the Prime Minister. A few days after receiving the Shah's terse note, Khomeini wrote back, this time threatening the monarch with the wrath of the Muslims. At the same time, he offered him some words of advice. Don't allow sycophants to attribute their anti-Islamic acts to your majesty. If ever there was a chance for a compromise between the Shah and Khomeini, it was in the course of these rare epistolary contracts, contacts. But compromise was not on either man's mind. The clergy finally brought enough pressure on the government that Alam, in a press conference, announced that the proposed bill had been withdrawn. Ayatollah Khomeini, till then a little-known figure outside religious circles, took the lead in writing a letter to all religious leaders around the country, congratulating them on their first major victory. He wrote less like just another cleric, but like the leader of an unfolding revolution. The tone was messianic and self-assured, and the goals set for the moment movement were ambiguous but tantalizing. 
This was 1962. For the Shah, however, the decision to withdraw the law was only a tactical retreat. Before long, on January 6, 1963, he announced a six-part program, the first volley of the renamed Shah and People Revolution. It included, amongst other things, two articles the clergy adamantly opposed. Article 1 called for land reform. This was, according to the British Embassy, one of the most revolutionary measures in a 3,000-year history of Iran. The second article called for the right of women to vote and stand for office. The other four points covered nationalization of forests, sale of state-owned enterprises, profit-sharing by workers in 20% of corporate profits, and finally the creation of a literacy course, the idea of using army conscripts as teachers in the Iranian countryside where illiteracy was sometimes estimated to be near 90%. While the major controversy of the illiteracy course was simply the question of pride of authorship, three different sources claim to have initially come up with the idea. The land reform and women's rights to vote became the most contested issues of the White Revolution. The entire clerical hierarchy went into high gear to oppose these two elements. Moreover, on January 9th, the Shah announced his decision to hold a referendum on January 26. The date was picked in order to complete operations before the beginning of the Ramdan, Sikh, the month of fasting for Muslims. To counter the argument that the Iranian constitution did not allow for a referendum, an argument made against Mossadegh, the Shah argued that Addenda 26 and 27 to the constitution stipulate that the powers of the country are derived from the nation, thus allowing him to go directly to the people and ask for a legal mandate for his white revolution. The White House was not pleased with the decision for an entirely different reason. The Shah, they concluded, had decided to wrap himself firmly in mantle of revolutionary monarch. In their opinion, the Shah had bought Arsenjani's idea of building political bases among the peasantry and decided to have his own revolution without U.S. advice. Moreover, in what is retrospect, turned out to be an almost prophetic prediction of the 1979 revolution. The White House was worried that land redistribution without extensive social reform would result in chaos and turn the newly activated peasantry against the Shah. What they failed to pred predict was that with the rise of Iran's oil revenues, cities would become magnets for these disgruntled peasants, and that in the cities they would turn against the Shah and be absorbed by the clergy's wide network of organizations. Becoming foot soldiers of the Islamic Revolution, the life of Iran's controversial 21st century president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, follows this trajectory rather closely. The Shah and his regime did all they could to turn the referendum into a tour de force. Some of the leaders of the opposition, with the exception of the clergy, were arrested. On January 23, for example, according to the CIA, the government brought 3,000 peasants from Veramin, the 12 buses from Karaj, to march in the streets of Tehran and shout pro-Shah slogans. Flexing his military muscle, the Shah also ordered a battalion of paratroopers to parade through Tehran, Tehran. Tehran that day. A tank company was ordered onto the Jalalay racetrack, earlier the site of the big National Front rally. The symbolism was hard to miss. On the same day, in the city of Qom, about 300 seminarians led about 3,000 demonstrators on a march against the referendum in the morning while the afternoon and government brought 5,000 peasants into the city to show support for the Shah. 
the peasants allegedly attacked the mullahs who had been against the regime shouting slogans and wielding sticks the referendum was at once unusually democratic and expectantly undemocratic it was democratic in that women were for the first time allowed to vote but their votes were not going to be counted this was partially to put women on a collision course with the clergy who had opposed women's suffrage Khomeini's views at that time for example were clear and categorical using a thinly disguised allusion to the shah khomeini said the court of the illegitimate usurper has decided to offer men and women equal rights and trample on the edicts of the quran and sharia and they want to take eighteen-year-old girls to serve in the army other ayatollahs were even more vituperative in the opposition to women's right to vote and their equality before the law in many areas from laws of inheritance and divorce to laws on custody of children in a case of divorce to testimony testimonies in the court of law islamic sharia is decidedly against women some critics have pointed to the composite of these laws as the legal foundation for gender apartheid in iran the early signs of this gender apartheid were evident in the clergy's opposition to the Shah's intended reforms in favor of women. Ironically, the Iranian opposition, even amongst the feminists, also never supported these reforms, dismissing them as cosmetic and superficial. But in 1963, the participation of women in the referendum was intended to show them who their foes were and also to give them a taste of power women were unlikely to leave the political world the american embassy reported without a fight while the participation of women albeit merely symbolic added to the democratic value of the referendum the fact that voters were required to vote in open ballot boxes under the watchful eyes of the police and secretary forces stationed in every voting place made the results highly suspect not surprisingly ninety nine point five per cent of those who voted cast a ballot in favor of the white revolution with a little more than four thousand people out of an electorate of nearly six million daring to ask for a no ballot the success of the referendum was a cause temp of tempered joy in the kennedy white house robert comer president kennedy's point man on iran who was refreshingly frank in his views and notes decided that it has been a long time since we last massaged the shah the referendum and the proposed reforms he said provide a first-class occasion for jfk to do it and to remind him that big brother is watching Kennedy did write the note of congratulation. No sooner had the Shah received it than he decided that it offered him an opening to further consolidate his relations with the American president. He immediately sent a message inviting President and Mrs. Kennedy to visit Iran at their earliest convenience. The response was not satisfactory to the Shah. Kennedy, after expressing deepest gratitude, and reiterating his interest in the Shah's progressive reform movement, informed him that he must nevertheless decline the invitation. But the Shah had other, more immediate problems to face after the referendum. He was aware of the clergy's opposition to his reforms and their boycott of the referendum, and he was angry at what he felt was a de facto alliance between them and disgruntled landowners. He went on a carefully calibrated offensive. The regime had also received reports that the clergy were planning to turn the roused passions common in the month of Maharam into political demonstrations against the Shah and his reforms. It is during the first ten days of the month that Shiites mourn the martyrdom of their third imam. Hussein in the Battle of Karbala in A.D. 642, and the processions of flagellating men and weeping women crowd city streets. 
the Shah and his trusted Prime Minister, Alam, set out for a multifaceted strategy. They began marshalling militarily and security forces for the possible day of reckoning, and the Shah also commenced a public relations campaign against the mullahs. On the one hand, he needed to label his clerical opponents not just as reactionaries, but as lackeys of foreign powers, particularly of Gamal Abdel Nasser in Egypt. Even with the luxury of hindsight, the Shah, in his answer to history, suggests that in 1963, Tehran riots were inspired by an obscure individual who claimed to be a religious leader, Ruhola Khomeini. It was certain, however, that he had secret dealing with foreign agents. Later, the radio stations run by atheists, emigres, belonging to the Tuta party, accorded him the title of Ayatollah. Sorry, I'm going to back up here. But the Shah had other, more immediate problems to face after the referendum. He was aware of the clergy's opposition to his reforms and their boycott of the referendum, and he was angry at what he felt was the de facto alliance between them and disgruntled landowners. He went on a carefully calibrated offensive. The regime had also received reports that the clergy were planning to turn the roused passions common in the month of Muharram into political demonstrations against the Shah and his reforms. Anyway, moving along. Virtually every claim in these three sentences is at best inaccurate, if not altogether wrong. Sadly, with many passages, like the answer to history has become yet another example of what Francis Du Maurier's famously said of the courtiers surrounding the king after the French Revolution. They have forgotten nothing and learned nothing. Moreover, as the Shah confided to Ambassador Holmes in 1963, he knew that in attacking the mullahs he must not seem anti-religious. As a result, concurrently, with his surprisingly blistering attacks on the clergy who dared oppose him, he also gave many speeches re-emphasizing his own Muslim faith, and that religion is essential for any nation. More than once, he referred to his three spiritual experiences as a child, when he was saved by Shiite imams. He tried to offer himself as at once a defender of the faith and a crusader against reactionary clerics. In Qom, he told the assembled peasants, I can tell you today that in practice and in past experiences, no one can claim to be closer to dog, to God and, <laughs> excuse me, to be closer to God and to saints than me. His attacks on the clergy were surprisingly uncompromising. On April 2, 1963, taking a page out of his father's playbook, the Shah traveled to the city of Guam, the heartland of Shiite power in Iran, and not only delivered deeds to farmers from 87 different villages, but delivered in detailed and stinging attack on the clergy, never a great speaker in this and other similarly belligerent talks, he soared to new heights of oratory. Often he talked without notes, and in the excitement of the moment, with the adulation of the crowd that both had a financial stake in the reforms and had been coached to exhibit monarchist exuberance, he eloquently criticized the clergy. Evidence shows clearly that in some of these meetings, 
uniformed members of the military were spread throughout the crowd, acting both as coaches of exuberance and guards of safety. On that April day, the Shah spoke of the clergy's little empty and antique brains that wished to turn back society to the days of the Middle Ages, making an unmistakable reference to the practice common in some villages, whereby every peasant girl was required to be deflowered by the landlord before her nuptial night, the Shah knowing full well Iranian men's obsessions with questions of honor and virginity asked rhetorically why these obscurantist mullahs were insistent on keeping alive the feudal system in which, before the first night of the nuptial, some shameful acts were required. And then he made a clear threat against his opponents by saying, if necessary, we will even shed the blood of some innocent people to eliminate this group of miserable, ignorant elements. There is no alternative and it should be done. Four days later, in the city of Kashan, he made an even more blistering attack on the clergy. He called them Black Reaction, his unmistakable code name for the clergy opposed to him. By then, Red Reaction had also become his favorite code for communists. He defiantly declared, the days of Black Reaction have ended, Theirs were the days when they used to get a free ride off the people's shoulders. Today is the time of logic and reason, and they, like madmen, are trying to lie. As the Shah was preparing for a confrontation with the clergy who opposed him, the mullahs, increasingly under the leadership of Ayatollah Khomeini, also began to prepare for their fight with the Shah. Until the death of Ayatollah Borojerdi Khomeini had been forced to remain in the shadows. Nevertheless, he had, in spite of Ayatollah Borojerdi's injunction, decided to support and align with a young, fiery, rabble-rousing cleric turned terrorist called Navab Safavi, the founder of Fedayan e Islam, Martyrs of Islam, the most powerful Islamic terrorist group in modern Iranian history. Safavi had been executed by the Shah's regime in 1955. Now, with Bur Borojerdi's death, Khomeini was stepping into the limelight and appealing not only to the more radical younger elements of the clergy, but to the remnants of Safavi's followers. In those days, the network of Islamic forces was as nebulous and nimble as it was invisible to the untrained eye, which incidentally included Sabak. The network included classes in the Quran, religious camps for different ages, mourning groups in charge of organizing processions and mourning ceremonies, women's groups, and a number of publishing houses, many located in the city of Qom, which published large circulation magazines and books. There were also a large number of political groups. Aside from the freedom movement, the more religious wing of the National Front, there are there were at least three other underground organizations active against the regime. In March 1963, Ayatollah Khomeini called the leaders of the three underground groups to his house and asked them to unite their forces in anticipation of the coming battles with the regime. After some cajoling, the groups agreed and created one organization. Khomeini even suggested a name for the new group, Mo Talef, the coalition, a name that would be neutral and acceptable to all groups. Under Khomeini's advice, the new group created a military wing to be used in terrorist acts, as well as a political wing. They immediately set out to create a national network that used public phones, often a around mosques to organize united actions.
It was a measure of the power of the new group in 1963 that they could distribute 250,000 copies of some of Khomeini's proclamations. Even then, when tape recorders were a novelty in Iran, tapes of some of his talks were also distributed widely through his clandestine network. Savak learned of the group's existence only a year after its creation. In 1978, the network of Khomeini's seminarians became the main vehicle for establishing clerical hegemony over the burgeoning but deeply disunited democratic movement. Khomeini put only two constraints on the group's activities. Before killing anyone, they must have the fatwa of a cleric, and they should not receive arms from anyone but should buy it. But considering the group's extensive influence inside the bazaars of the country, finding money to support the group was not difficult not a difficult task. Before long, the terrorist tentacles of the group would reach not just deep inside the Shah's regime, but within the walls of his palaces. The 1965 assassination of a prime minister and the failed attempt on the Shah's life that same year were both the work of religious zealots. Once formed, the group helped by a number of other ad hoc groups and personalities began advertising for Ayatollah Khomeini as a new Marja Taglid or source of emulation. Shiism divides the community of believers into two groups, the handful of emulated Ayatollahs and the rest of the flock. Each Shiite must choose an Ayatollah to emulate. What makes an educated cleric into a marja e is the publication of a treatise called Tauzi al Masail, Answers to Questions, a catechism like narrative that consists of that cleric's answers, fatwas, to questions. Khomeini by then a popular teacher at the seminary, decided to publish his Tawiz al Masail at this time. Many of his students claim that they pressured Khomeini into publishing the text. With the death of Borojerdi, those who emulated him would bus people from around the country in groups of 20 to Qom ostensibly to meet with Khomeini and appraise him as a potential Ayatollah to follow. In reality, the purpose of these meetings was to exchange views and information which could then be passed to other groups, a telephone network, and a special fund to defray the cost of the movement were also established. The two armies, one composed of the military and security forces, and belonging to the Shah and the other consisting of the supporters of Khomeini clashed on June 5th, the tenth day of Muharram, when passions were aroused. In the early hours of the day, commandos attacked Ayatollah Khomeini's house in Qom, put him under arrest, and brought him to Tehran in an unmarked car. News of his arrest arrived in Tehran before he and his captors did. His network of supporters took to the streets shouting slogans, burning banks and cinemas, attacking governmental offices, even attempting to take over the radio station. Alam also estimated that approximately 2,000 of the demonstrators were fanatical and pro-Mullah, and the rest were the South Tehran mob, which responds to any opportunity to destroy and loot. Other sources have put the figure of demonstrators in the tens of thousands. It is also true that the other bigger cities were participating in the mass uprising. Even before the uprising began, Alam 
had asked and surprisingly received the Shah's consent to command the military and security forces for the duration of the uprising. His idea was simple. He would use the full force of the militia to put down the uprising. And, if he succeeded, the Shah could take the credit and suffer no blame. If Alam failed, the Shah would fire him and accuse him of mismanagement. Lest the Shah prove indecisive in the middle of the confrontation, Alam made sure his contacts with him that day were minimal. The armed forces were ordered to shoot to kill. Alam told the generals, The guns you were given are not toys. Use them. The morning of June 5th, the Shah called Alam and asked, And now that we have a revolution on our hands, what will you do? Alam said, Guns and cannons are in my hand. I will tear their mothers apart. The Shah laughed from the bottom of his heart and said, I agree, and I am fully behind you. By that night, Tehran was awash with rumors about rivers of blood and of an imminent court-martial for Ayatollah Khomeini with a death sentence to be handed down for treason. The organizations and networks he had used with leaders like Ali Khamenei, Hussein Ali Montazeri, and Ali Akbar Hashemi, Raf Sanjani, all future leaders of the Republic, got busy encouraging Ayatollahs from around the world to write to the Shah and confirm that Khomeini was a full-fledged Ayatollah and was thus protected by a provision of the Iranian constitution prohibiting the death penalty for Ayatollahs. In fact, no such provision exists, and the constitutional movement proved the power of their popular base when they executed Sheikh Fazola Nuri, an Ayatollah, at the time a foe of the constitutional movement, and later a hero of Khomeini. Yet, if Alam is to be believed, the possibility of the death penalty was for Khomeini was simply a false rumor. On the afternoon of June 6, Alam told U.S. Ambassador Holmes that Khomeini would be tried by a military court for inciting against public order and resistance to enforcement of law. He expected the court would not give more than a prison sentence. More crucially, Alam even claims that while religious leaders had formally sent notes supporting Khomeini, they had sent word to the Prime Minister that their appeals should be disregarded. Alam was counting on jealousy of Khomeini and individual rivalries amongst the mullahs for preventing Khomeini from ever emerging as the leader of the Shiite community. Incredible as Alam's claim about private communications against Khomeini from Ayatollahs might seem, it fits what is now known about the bad blood between the unyielding mullah and other more moderate clergy, particularly Shariat Madari. In fact, Ayatollah Shariat Madari believed that on June 5th, Khomeini, in cooperation with a supposed army of nomadic tribes led by the Kwashagai brothers, was actually planning to seize power. On the afternoon of June 8, when the Shah and Abbas and on the afternoon of June 8, when the Shah and Ambassador Holmes were in a meeting, Hussein Allah and Abdullah Entazam, an elder statesman, and for many years the head of Iran's oil company, went to the court, and according to the Shah, they shouted at me and said, Enough is enough, enough bloodshed, dismiss the government of Alam, and make your peace with the mullahs. The Shah heard their arguments, but then, in his own words, threw Allah and Entazam out of his office, summoned Alam to the court, and ordered him to arrest the two men. Alam also makes clear that the Shah had ordered out not just Allah and Entazam, but the other three elder statesmen who had met at Allah's house 
and complain about the government's approach to the crisis. Alam claims he did not follow the Shah's orders, however asking him for forgiveness. Reports and rumors about the number of people killed on June 5th range from the opposition's claim of thousands to the regime's official figure of about 120. The American embassy gave the number of dead as 200. When the Shah was in exile and free from the immediate incentive to fudge or fidget, a curious Dennis Wright sent to the Bahamas by Margaret Thatcher to meet the Shah asked him about the real number of those killed that June, and the Shah declared that the same number announced by the government at the time had been correct. Moreover, contrary to the fear that the army would not fire on their fellow citizens, something that had frightened the Shah two years earlier, the army proved willing and killed no small number of protesters. The White House, on the other hand, was not happy with the events of June 5th. Two weeks after the event, Ambassador Holmes was instructed to protest to the Shah about the incompetence of his government. By June 6th, the city began to return to normalcy. For the rest of his political life, Alam never ceased reminding the Shah that he saved the throne and derensinated the power of the clergy. A few days after the bloodshed, when Dennis Wright met Alam, he found him like a cheerful schoolboy, and he seemed quite unworried by last week's rioting. Rather like an ostrich, I fear. Wright concluded, however, that nothing is quite the same. Serious trouble, who he wrote, has been nipped in the bud for the time being, but this won't be the end. A couple of weeks after the June riots, a dispatch from the British Embassy in Tehran concluded that the weakness of character and judgment the Shah had shown in the past had not been exercised. The country is waiting for leadership, which somehow, despite all the brave words the Shah never quite provides. At the same time, taking the cues from taking his cues from the Shah, Alam continued trying to convince leaders of the National Front, many of them then in prison, to join a coalition government. If before the bloody suppression such a coalition was hard to imagine, after that June it was virtually impossible to fathom. The U.S. Embassy kept asking about the time when the imprisoned National Front leaders would be released, and the Shah clearly felt he must make at least one more gesture of readiness for reconciliation. As he told the American ambassador on July 18, 1963, he had agreed to the broad outlines of a deal with the National Front. In fact, while they were in prison, the leaders met with the Iranian who introduced himself as a well-wisher, who had close ties to representatives of the U.S. government and tried to hammer out the terms of this deal. The deal called for the release of the leaders and a meeting with the Shah, when they would give him oral assurances that they accept his leadership and realize that during this revolutionary period, the Shah must play more active role than of constitutional monarch. The only hitch, as the U.S. Embassy observed, was that the National Front leaders wanted to first be set free and then work out the finer elements of the agreement, but the Shah did not trust them. Eventually, the Shah agreed to have the men put on parole for a stated period to see whether or not they would comply with the understanding tentatively reached. The deal ultimately fell through, as the younger, more radical elements of the National Front agitated against it. What is not clear is whether the Shah really intended to seek reconciliation with the National Front, or whether he made the offer in the hope of sowing 
dissension amongst the ranks of the front and in this way separating the more moderate elements from the west in reality the reverse happened some of the more radical members of the national front became convinced after the bloody suppression of the june uprising that there was no room for reconciliation with the shah they took up arms against the regime the religious elements created the mojahedin e kelk mek m e k and the marxists founded the fedayen e kelk iran martyrs of the people in less than six years in what came to be known as the shia Khal incident taking its name from the village nearby a small group of these radicals fought against the small military post station there the battle would shock the shah and the intelligence agencies and lead to the use of increasingly harsher methods by savak and numerous reports of torture the leaders of the national front were not the only ones surprised by developments after june fifth alam clearly felt he was owed a long tenure in appreciation of his role in saving the crown he at least he had at least one other major accomplishment again under the direct command of the shah iran normalized its tense relations with the soviet union this was the first step in a major shift in the shah's foreign policy if in 1963 he promised the Soviets that Iran would never allow a foreign military base on its soil, footnote, the Shah kept his promise only in the most literal sense of the agreement. Iran, in fact, allowed the U.S. and British intelligence agencies to establish highly sensitive listening stations in Iran's northern provinces that monitored Soviet nuclear activities. End of footnote. Two years later, after an important trip by the Shah to the Soviet Union, a new leaf was formed. A new leaf was turned in the relations between the two countries. Iran agreed to sell gas to the Soviet government in return for help in establishing a steel mill, something the Shah and his father had coveted for more than three decades. In many private conversations, Alam tried to take at least some of the credit for his normalization. But along but none of these real or claimed services could have saved him. In fact, he had a big surprise in store. A little more than two weeks after the June fifth uprising with the Shah shared his intentions to dismiss. Excuse me. A little more than two weeks after the June 5th uprising, the Shah shared his intentions to dismiss Alam and appoint Hassan Ali Mansour with an American embassy official. Furthermore, the Shah felt the need to engage in a ruthless dismissal of some of the people surrounding him, a house cleaning. Amongst those the Shah wanted to dismiss were Jafar Sharif. Amami and Abdullah Entazam. He also planned to create a single political party to become the main political force in the future. Before long, the Shah put his support behind the progressive circle and ordered the creation of the Iran Novan Party. At this time, the Shah confided to the British Embassy that he was now convinced of the need of a one-party system in order to reach the people. These pronouncements are particularly interesting in light of the fact that only three years earlier, in Mission for My Country, the Shah had condemned one-party systems as benefiting only totalitarian communist societies. In the meantime, one of the accusations against Ayatollah Khomeini was that he had accepted money from Nasser of Egypt. Khomeini was also accused of creating an unholy alliance with General Bak 
TR. And it was this alliance, the regime claimed, that had played a role in fanning the flames of discontent. Many in Iran, and some of the diplomats stationed in Tehran at the time, doubted the veracity of the charge that Khomeini had taken money from Nasser. Dennis Wright, for example, wrote in his journal, A tense day, martial law, Persian government is claiming Nasser's hand behind it. I doubt this very much. Using the safety of exile, back TR had he, in fact, began to actively work against the Shah. He had no qualms about his potential allies. Whoever was against the Shah, from Nasser in Egypt to Ayatollah Khomeini, communist members of the Tuta party, or members of the newly established Confederation of Iranian Students, and after 1968, the Ba'ath party in Iraq, he saw as a potential ally, ally the, and went out of his way to form an alliance with them. In fact, Bakhtiar's action against the Shah had begun in the days when he was still the head of Savak. In the fall of 1959, he had let American officials know that he was sympathetic to the idea of action which would place him at the head of Iranian government. On March 10, 1959, the CIA reported that Bakhtiar has been making contingency plans for the time. The Shah lost control. A month later, the same source reported to a meeting of the National Security Council that Bakhtiar was continuing to formulate plans. In the event the Shah disappears, Bakhtiar even tried to frighten the American government into supporting him. In August of that year, Bakhtiar told American officials that present policies of Shah and government are leading Iran towards revolution and that he expects the Shah will flee to Europe in near future. Proof of this prediction, Bakhtiar told American officials, was that the Shah was converting royal property into hard currency and no longer showed any interest in domestic investments. Ironically, Bakhtiar, who had by then come to symbolize all the brutalities of Savak, whose name conjured terrifying tales of torture against the opposition and rampant financial corruption in the regime, claimed that the chief source of his discontent was the fact that the Shah had forced him to use Savak to rig elections. In recent elections, American officials were told the Shah had personally picked every one of the Majlis deputies. These efforts to woo American support for the idea of a coup had all failed. Interestingly, there is no evidence that the CIA reported any of these machinations to the Shah only in 1961 when Bakhtiar tried to convince the Ken Kennedy administration to support his plans did King Roosevelt inform the Shah. What Bakhtiar had failed to accomplish with the Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations in the years between 1959 and 1962, he tried to achieve in exile. He first tried to solicit the help of the British. On October 12, 1962, he met with Dennis Wright, who had served in Iran for many years and was soon to return as ambassador. The meeting took place in the Ritz Hotel in Canes, where Bakhtiar was spending some of his time. Bakhtiar, sorry, Bakhtiar was known as a bon vivant and an incorrigible womanizer, and the French Riviera had always been of his favorite spots. He talked of growing discontent among all classes in Iran and of increasing Russian influence in the country. He blamed the Shahs exclusivity for the country's serious troubles. Iran's sole salvation, Bakhtiar said, was for a strong man and an equally strong team to rule in the name of the crown prince. There was of course no doubt that the strong man he had in mind was none other than Bakhtiar himself. Dennis Wright was less than supportive. 
He first gave the standard British claim when they wanted to refuse help to someone saying, Britain did not get involved in the domestic political situation of Iran. Bakhtiar knew as well as anyone how influential the British were in Iran's domestic politics. Bakhtiar himself owned his job as the head of Savak, at least partially. Sorry, Bakhtiar himself owed his job as the head of Savak, at least partially, to their support. But the crucial part of Wright's response came when he said it was the policy of Her Majesty's government to support the Shah. After that October 1962 meeting, the British government faced a dilemma. Should they keep silent and hope that the Shah never found out about the meeting? Or should they tell him about the meeting and risk his wrath, but also stoke the fires of his paranoia about what he considered the constant British machinations against him? Dennis Wright argued that they should tell the Shah exactly what had happened, emphasizing that as far as they were concerned, Bakhtiar had virtually ambushed him and assure him that no other contacts with the general were planned. The British government chose the right approach, but the Shah was not convinced that they were telling the truth. In fact, a few years later, one of the biggest public confrontations between Iran and Britain took place over Bakhtiar's alleged ties to the British. The Shah's troubles on the days of the June uprising were not limited to Khomeini, Bakhtiar, angry landlords keen on keeping their villages from exploration and the disgruntled urban population. On the night of June 6, 1963, the royal family and a handful of their friends were gathered for what was beginning to have the regularity of ritual, an evening at the house of one of the members of the Shah's family. Dinner, a card game for some, a film for all, and early retirement to their individual homes. That night, it was Princess Ashraf's turn. The Shah and the Queen were, as was customary, the last to arrive. That night, with occasional sounds of gunfire in the air, the Shah arrived in his Royal Air Force uniform. He still smoked in those days, and after sipping some scotch, Black Label was his favorite, and smoking half a cigarette with his long holder, he began to go around to meet with the guest. Everyone was nervous. Groups of three and four had gathered around the large hall and chatted in hushed voices. When the Shah finally came to the group that included Dr. Ye Yeya Adil, his friend of many years and a member of the loyal opposition party of martyrdom, he was shocked by the sudden verbal volley of angry words coming from Adele. Do you know what is happening around the city? Dr. Adele asked. In a voice trembling with anger, he said, You can't keep your throne afloat on a river of blood. The hall suddenly came to a complete silence. Yeah, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about, replied the Shah. Those, like Adele, who knew the Shah well, were aware that when he was particularly angry at a friend, he would call him by his first name. But to everyone's surprise, Adele's outburst cost him nothing other than this one sentence. Dr. Adele's surprising burst of anger that night was simply the tip of the iceberg. Scholars like Anne Lampton considered June 5, 1963, a turning point in the history of Iran, in that it was on that day that the Shah showed unexpected resolution in dealing with troublemakers. This was a far cry from the judgment passed by Sir Roger Stevens in 1958, as he was leaving his post as British ambassador to Iran. He is, I fear, he wrote of the Shah, incapable of formulating, let alone executing a really constructive policy of any kind. So long as he is on the throne of Persia, it is hard to imagine that there will be a decent government, let alone social justice. 
the radical clergy claimed that the day was proof positive that reform within the Shah's regime was untenable, and the only solution was a revolution. For forces loyal to Ayatollah Khomeini, June 5, 1963, was nothing short of the birth of the Khomeini movement. For Alam, on the other hand, June 5th was the end of the Shah Khomeini's problem. From that day on, he never ceased reminding the Shah that thanks to his efforts, the mullahs were no longer a viable political force. For the Shah, the day was also historic in that it once and for all exposed the reactionary nature of his opposition. But reports of the army's opening fire on defenseless demonstrators and of thousands of dead, as the opposition claimed, did little to improve the Shah's image or to endear him to the Kennedy administration. In May 1963, in a brief prepared at the White House, the opinions and suggestions of different factions in the administration were clearly articulated. What is incredible is the sharp, stark reality that virtually no one supported the Shah and his increasingly personal rule outright. According to the brief, Attorney General Justice Douglas and some legislators and academic figures believe U.S. should force the Shah to turn power to pro-Mossadegh urban white-collar groups around the National Front. Associate Supreme Court Justice William Douglas, in fact, went on one step further himself, writing that, I talked to Jack Kennedy frequently about conditions in Iran and the corruption that was rampant. Then, when he entertained the Shah at the White House, when he was here on an official visit, visit, Jack concluded that the Shah was corrupt and not a person we could trust. The idea was to withdraw American support for the Shah, causing his abdication, and bring to power a regency that had already been selected. Other sources suggest that aside from Ali Amini and the Quashgai brothers, a couple of other National Front leaders were considered for the Regency Council. The State Department opposed this alternative and concluded that it would only lead to a replay of Mossadegh-era chaos with communists having learned not to miss their cues. But Robert Kennedy and Justice Douglas were not the Shah's only critics in the Kennedy administration. Another group particularly popular in the Department of Defense and the CIA believed that the Shah was weak, inefficient, and confused and has needlessly raised a hornet's nest. They advocated that the United States force the Shah to halt reforms and turn over power to military-based traditional groups. A third group wanted the United States to force the Shah to turn over power to a young Western-trained economist. Kennedy's assassination on November 22, 1963 put an end to these speculations. There was a new president and a new policy. What is invariably surprising about the liberal-minded administration is the ease with which they talked of regime change in Iran and about deciding in Washington that the structure of power should be in Tehran. Kennedy's last correspondence with the Shah was about the same issue that had preoccupied the two men from the beginning, and that had become a point of contention between them. It related to the size of the Iranian military and the nature of the threat to Iran. In the letter, Kennedy used a new argument, telling the Shah that since the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, it had become obvious that the United States had strategic superiority over the Soviet Union, and thus the Shah did not and thus the Shah did not need to worry about the Soviet threat. The Shah was sensitive to the attitude of the US and British governments towards him and was affected by the tensions with the K 
Kennedy brothers. On November 22nd, hours after Kennedy was assassinated, the State Department concluded that the Shah needs fresh assurances. On the other hand, on hearing the news of the Kennedy assassination, the Shah personally dictated to Foreign Minister Abbas Aram an angry diatribe against Kennedy addressed to President Lyndon Johnson. In the letter, the Shah accused Kennedy of a failure to understand the intricacies of Iranian politics and of unduly interfering in the affairs of the country. The Shah had specifically ordered Aram to send the letter without showing it to anyone, but Aram shared the letter with Alam and both decided against sending it. After a few days, Alam informed the Shah of his decision not to send the letter. The Shah, visibly shaken and angry, threw the letter to the ground, leaving the room in a rage. For the next two weeks, he refused to talk to Alam or to grant him the regular audiences set aside for the Prime Minister. Even at parties and official ceremonies, the Shah pointedly shunned Alam and made no attempt to hide his dismay. Finally, of course, they reconciled, but the Shah's bitter feelings toward the Kennedys lingered, and as Alam's daily journals show, reared their head regularly, particularly in biting remarks the Shah made about the Kennedys in private. Even the long meandering letter that was eventually sent to Johnson offered both condolences for the assassination and confidence and hope that U.S.-Iranian relations would thrive in the coming years free from the misunderstanding, from e free from any misunderstanding. The psychological impact of those trying years on the Shah's political pers persona can be seen in two profiles of him prepared during the height of these tensions. One was written by officials of the British government, the other by an American journalist. On the day after the fall of the Amini government in July 1962, an American journalist named C.D. Jackson visited the Shah in Tehran in preparation of a profile he was writing for Time magazine. Editors of the magazine, on a confidential basis, sent a copy of the essay to Press Secretary Pierre Salinger for President Kennedy's information. Jackson met the Shah on August 7th. He described the Sa'ad Abad Palace as a disappointment. Some kind of European hodgepodge a mixture of Italian, French, and as far as I was concerned, North German Lloyd. About the time, about the same time, in a visit to the court for an official ceremony, the British ambassador noticed the extent to which westernization had affected the essentially Persian style. A string orchestra played Western music, nothing Persian at all except the pila, rice pila, at the end of the European dinner. Jackson found the room where he met the Shah even less appealing. The furniture was atrocious, the decorations were ghastly. As to the Shah himself, he appeared to be in good shape, lean, good condition, dark soulful eyes, tremendous busy dark eyebrows, and hair beginning to go a little gray at the temples. His trader is not very good, sorry, his tailor is not very good, and the guy from whom he gets his neckties should be subjected to some sort of ancient Persian punishment. The Shah began the interview by offering a thinly disguised critique of the Kennedy policy in Iran, relying on the standard cultural re relativist argument that the countries were totally different. They were different racially. They were different to their customs and mores. He opined that, as far as Persian history was concerned, there, where there had been a really strong leader, Persia had almost conquered the world. He also made 
what was by then one of his standard complaints, criticizing the administration for continuing military aid to his nemesis, Nasser, in Egypt. The interview ended with another question that would, in later years, became a far more urgent issue for the Shah. Jackson asked the Shah whether he ever got depressed and whether he had any friends. The Shah replied yes, that he got depressed, not very often, and that he had no friends, anywhere. I have companions for jokes, but no friend to whom I can look up to as wiser than I am, who can give me the right kind of advice. For Jackson, the responses indicated that he was talking to a modern Hamlet, a man with all the right instincts, intelligent, capable of understanding what the game is, but with a fundamental, temperamental reluctance to play the game to the fullest. Another profile, this time prepared by the British Embassy, captures the early stages of the Shah's authoritarian power, as well as the vulnerability of such absolute power. The author of the report writes that already no public situation, civil or military, domestic or external, economic, political or social, no senior appointment, no promotion, transfer, reward or punishment takes place without the Shah's approval. But the report points to the reality that the complexities of the modern state are inevitably beyond the control of a single individual. Because of exorbitant panegyrics, because of exorbitant panegyrics of sycophants who the Shah had gathered around him, he was, according to the profile, being increasingly convinced that only he is capable of governing this country. Even more dangerous, according to the report, was the fact that though he is genuinely patriotic, he is also egotistical and not incorruptible. He is inclined to lose his nerves, and some accuse him of cowardice. If he is autocratic, he can also be indecisive and irresolute readily changing his mind according to the latest advice. Worst of all, according to the report, as the result of recent developments, he has become acutely unpopular. If the ambitions of Amini, the anger of teachers, and the new paradigm of politics promoted by the Kennedy administration were not enough to make the early 1960s interesting for the Shah, there was also the problem of the indomitable Kayabar Khan, one-time ally, turned indefatigable foe, who used the American media and the Congress to make serious allegations of fraud against the Shah, his family, and courtiers. He fabricated checks showing large deposit in large deposits in the Shah's accounts from funds set aside by the United States for social causes in Iran. It took the Shah many years and the help of many lawyers to finally convince the U.S. government that Kabar Khan was not a reliable source. In this period, another issue that occupied the Shah's mind was the question of a status of forces agreement, SOFA, with the United States. The Shah wanted American advisors to train Iran's military, particularly the Air Force. The U.S. Department of Defense, on the other hand, preconditioned the arrival of these adv advisors on the passage of the SOFA, something the United States has with every country where it has stationed forces. The SOFA being suggested in Iran, however, was more sensitive, as it completely exempted not only the servicemen, but their families from prosecution in Iranian courts. The State Department was against the idea of insisting on such a sofa, predicting that it would give rise to nationalist sentiments and would be considered a revival of the old colonial habit of capitulation rights. Many in Iran, including some in the government, also opposed the proposed SOFA for the 
SOFA for the same reasons. The Shah shepherded through the Iranian parliament the proposed agreement and cognizant of rising public sentiments against the bill, even encouraged some members of the Majlis to oppose it. Eventually, the law was passed after Prime Minister Hassan Ali Mansur knowingly lied to the parliament about its actual content. The most forceful opposition to the bill came from Ayatollah Khomeini, who was eventually exiled for his virulent anti-Shah, anti-Israel, and anti-American rhetoric. The Prime Minister soon paid with his life for his role in the affair, and Khomeini was capitulated into the center of Iranian politics. The events of 1963 had clearly affected the Shah's physical and psychological condition. In February of 1964, accompanied by the Queen, he took a trip to Europe. They were supposed to be gone for only two weeks. They stayed for five. As always, rumors began to spread. People whispered, why is he gone for so long? An explanation was required. Italiat offered the official explanation in an editorial. The trip, it said, was primarily motivated by the Shah's need for rest and for treatment of treatment for abdominal abdominal trouble, which usually stems from overwork and particularly tense intellectual activities and thought. In other words, so worried was the Shah about the country, and so hard had he been working, that he had developed something of an ulcer. The American embassy was not convinced. They said they were not sure that he, in fact, had an ulcer. He has chronic liver trouble, but not clear whether this flared up. What they learned from a fairly reliable report from Vienna medical source described his condition as anxiety complex. This turned out to be the first hint of the Shah's anxiety. Maybe his anxiety, as much as psychological as political, was rooted in the fact that he knew more by his unarticulated instinct than by reasoned insights that the socio-economic forces he had put into motion would sooner or later clash with his increasingly authoritarian style for rule. For the Shah, character was destiny. He was neither an efficient dictator nor a man willing to accept the constraints on his power set in place by the Constitution and made necessary by the increasingly modern characteristics of Iranian society, characteristics he himself had played a key role in creating.